It's Thursday, August 5. This is the News on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Agriculture and Fisheries Minister Floyd Green on Tuesday officially launched the $50 million National Small Ruminant Development Program at the Hounslow Research Station in St. Elizabeth. The program is geared towards rapidly increasing the population of primarily goat and sheep, thus increasing the local production, productivity, and quality of small ruminant meat and milk. The minister expanded on the program as he addressed the Nutrimix Goat Seminar at Denby on Wednesday. We get more in this report from Carol Francis. The initiative seeks to expand the genetic stock of goats on the island. This is to be achieved through the purchase and distribution of mature bucks to expand breeding support to small ruminant clusters across the island. Increasing the abundance and availability of breeding stock under the program through robust artificial insemination and embryo transfer will also improve the nation's food security. Minister Green says that more than 6,000 registered small ruminant farmers are to benefit for free from the initiative, which is aimed at growing the sector by 5% each year. The government is happy that we have a private sector player that is working with us in that regard. And I'm happy that we have more than one that has partnered with us to move this small ruminant sector forward. But we're not just leaving it to the private sector. In fact, we have announced that we're embarking on a $50 million small ruminant development program. Because again, the government has to play a facilitatory role to ensure we achieve the objectives that we set. So what are we doing? We're looking to target about 6,000 farmers over the next two years. We want to ensure that you have access to the best genetics, so those farmers will be able to get one to three strands of semen free of cost, paid for by the government of Jamaica, so that you can use that to drive your small ruminant population. He says the ultimate goal is to produce better goat farmers. And we're also going to be doing embryo transfers. We're also going to be bringing in new livestock so that we can get the genetics right. But importantly, we're going to be doing significant training around feed, around your rations, around your husbandry practices, your fodder banks, all of the elements that you need to be better goat farmers. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Carol Francis. We now get the latest COVID-19 update from the Health and Wellness Ministry. In the clinical management summer for Wednesday, August 5, 200 new COVID-19 cases were recorded. This pushes the overall case count to 53,839, with 5,138 cases active. Four deaths were also reported over the period, the death toll now climbing to 1,211. The parishes with the highest new cases were Kingston and St. Andrew with 71, followed by St. Catherine 30, St. Anne with 26, and St. Thomas 24. On the recovery side, the Health and Wellness Ministry listed 26 recoveries, which leaves the overall total at 47,127. There are 216 persons now in hospital. Of that number, 54 are moderate and 37 are said to be critical. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Melvin Pennant. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says he wants schools to reopen for face-to-face -face classes in September. However, for this to happen, he is urging the public to take the COVID-19 vaccines. Furthermore, we also have to consider that our children have been out of school for a year and a half. The impact on their education is significant and it will be long lasting. As a responsible government, we cannot place the education of your children, our children, at risk. Therefore, at this time, it will be necessary for the government to continue to tighten measures and to use non-clinical measures to manage the pandemic. However, there is a ray of hope. There is hope. And that hope comes in the form of the vaccine. Today, we have 300,000 more doses of vaccines than we had previously. 
it is a start. He was speaking at the recent arrival of 300,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which were a donation from the British government. 6,000 youth across the island stand to benefit from the Youth Summer Employment Program, YSEP. The program is spearheaded by the Local Government and Rural Development Ministry. Speaking at the launch of the program recently at the College of Agriculture, Science and Education case in Portland, Portfolio Minister Desmond McKenzie calls this a golden opportunity for young people. The YSEP participants will earn $10,000 weekly for the four-week period of the program, with team leaders earning $11,000 per week. The program began in 2017, and so far over 500 persons have participated. Set aside some extra cash this week. Motorists will have to pay more for gas and diesel when they go to the pumps. We get the details on this, plus look at other market updates in this business report. Effective Thursday, August 5, motorists are to pay more at the pumps for gasoline and diesel. Following increases of $1.77 and $1.23 respectively, 87 and 90 octane gasoline will be sold for $157.56 and $164.84 per liter. Automotive diesel fuel saw an increase of $1.28 and will be sold for $147.77 per liter. Ultra-low sulfur diesel is up by $1.33 and will be sold for $157.19 per liter. Kerosene saw a price increase of $1.47 and is to be sold for $125.14 per liter. Propane liquid petroleum saw a price increase of $1.90 and will be sold for $69.15 per liter. And butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $76.96 per liter after an increase of $1.48. Be on the lookout for price changes as marketing companies and retailers will add their markup to these prices. In Wednesday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 404 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 87 stocks, of which 31 advanced, 36 declined, and 20 traded firm. The junior market index declined by 23 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for Blue Power Group Limited, CAC 2000 9.5% preference shares, and Caribbean Cement Company Limited. Stocks declined for 1834 Investments Limited, Barita Investments Limited, and CAC 2000 Limited. Trading firm were Access Financial Services Limited, Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited, and Consolidated Bakers Jamaica Limited. Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with over 1.6 million units, followed by Scotia Group Jamaica Limited with over 1.3 million units, and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 1.1 million units. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, August 4, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $155.28. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $123.83. The pound sterling traded for $216.16 and the euro sold for an average $186.65. In market data for oil, prices rose towards $71 a barrel on Thursday on rising Middle East tensions while fresh movement restrictions imposed by countries to counter a surge in COVID-19 cases threatened the demand recovery. Brent crude futures added $0.50 cents to $70.68 a barrel. Brent crude futures added $0.50 cents to $70.88 a barrel after earlier dipping below $70 for the first time since July 21. West Texas Intermediate crude rose by $0.66 cents to $68.81 a barrel. Time now for news from the region. The chief medical officer in the Bahamas says it is highly likely that the more dangerous Delta variant of the coronavirus is circulating in the Bahamas. Jasmine Brown reports. Medical officer was candid in her comments as she insisted the rapid spread of COVID-19 now likely means the Delta variant is here. Our sequencing process, because we have to send it out of country, is delayed. We get results way after, you know. We, we know what would have happened in the past, but based on what we're seeing, we, you know, we believe that 
the, the, the Delta variant could be here. So let us, you know, act as if it is. Dr. McMillan's comments come as officials await the results of genomic testing and amid a surge in cases, hospitalizations and deaths. With more than 1,200 COVID cases confirmed in July, it was the worst month for reported COVID-19 cases the Bahamas has seen since last October. Many have speculated that the presence of the Delta variant could be contributing to the latest surge of cases. The likelihood that it is circulating is, is, is high. So let us not um, act as if it isn't. I prefer, I'm, I'm a preventionist. Uh, Onks of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Last month, the Pan American Health Organization advised that the Alpha variant was found in the majority of samples tested from the Bahamas. However, at the time, officials said there was no evidence of the Delta variant, which is significantly more transmissible and possibly causes more severe illness than other COVID strains. Minister of Health Renwood Wells has since said those samples that were tested were collected between March and April before the Delta variant spread rapidly across the globe. Dr. McMillan said this is not the time for Bahamians to let their guards down. This is evolving and um, certainly air on the side of caution. Wear your mask, and wear your mask, we'll sanitize, social distance, no large gatherings. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. In Antigua and Barbuda, progress is being made to restore Government House, which was built in the late 1700s to early 1800s. Jessica Russell has the details in this ABS News update. The vision for Government House continues to fall into place as work on the project moves forward. Work on the West Wing of Government House is progressing. We are on the level which will become converted into the Royal Cafe for events and other activities. And the lower level will be for the purposes of a deli. Right next to it will be a gift shop. It's being funded by a 750000 US dollar donation from the Calvinier Foundation and carried out by Challengers Enterprises. We are in the section which will be fully completed in terms of adding doors or windows and we are now at the stage where the mahogany windows and doors are being put in. Another portion of the property is being revamped thanks to a 250,000 US dollar donation from Lindbury Trust in the United Kingdom. His Excellency's office, many would have visited and would have had to skip holes and look, watch where they were going. Um, that is now being restored. The kitchen, which serious termite um, infestation in terms of damage to the wood, and that is also being restored. That work is being managed by Archiworks and is to be finished in four months. Meanwhile, a definitive date for when the commercial aspect will be operational could not be given. That will be dependent upon our ability to attract a donor to donate the items, the furnishings and the kitchen equipment to the deli and to the cafe for us. Once we get that done, we'll be ready to go. When the cafe and deli are open, the profits are to go into the maintenance of Government House. Jessica Russell, ABS News. In Guyana, with ongoing modernization works to be completed by December, three new contracts were signed for more upgrades to the Chedi Jagan International Airport. The contracts, totaling almost $600 million, will see the construction of two adjoining buildings and upgrades to a runway used to park aircrafts. Lifting the profile at the Chedi Jagan International Airport is what the government aims to do with the signing of three new contracts worth almost $600 million. These contracts are separate from the ongoing modernization works being done by China Harbor Engineering Corporation, which is slated to be completed by December 2021. With checks still to install two additional corridors for boarding bridges and final touches to the commercial space, works will soon begin on a new office building for CGIA staff. That contract for a design was awarded to the tune of $25 million, but another two-story building to the tune of $513 million will be completed to house airline, law enforcement and other support staff at the airport. The third contract for $38 million was also awarded for upgrade to a deplorable runway, Charlie, currently used for parking by airlines. Public Works Minister Juan Edgel was present at the signing ceremony along with Chief Executive Officer of the CGIA, Ramesh Gear. Edgel said the additional works are being done at the request of the corporation. He told the contractors that the works will be done during the peak period and should be executed cognizant of the other ongoing works and the limited interruption to the other operations at the airport. So the clear message that I would like to give to all three of you 
is that we're getting to work and there must be a collaborative approach for swift, efficient implementation. And that has to be done in the context that we are in a peak season where traffic is concerned and we still have another major contractor on site. China Harbor, that is supposed to be putting up the curtain wall, the superstructure for uh, commercial space, and the corridors for two additional boarding bridges. Ngir explained that with the construction of the new office building, it will also free up space for more commercial activity. He explained that a duty-free bond will also be built at the airport. This new building will house a space for a conference room, offices for the airline and all the other support agency, law enforcement agency, wrong handlers. Uh, because what is happening at the moment, Minister, the demand uh, from the existing operators and from the new carriers for offices, you know, we don't have enough space. Uh, additionally, um, with the expansion work that is taking place and the extension of the existing part of the building, uh, the we have uh, more duty-free shops, a more uh, a concession. So the duty-free shop, we normally have to have a bond, a duty-free bond to store their goods. So this new building is going to also house a duty-free um, bond. Upgrade works at the CGI have been ongoing for several years now. Newsroom, Kurt Campbell. In sports, we put the spotlight on the latest from the ongoing Tokyo Olympic Games. Our very own Melvin Pennant has the details. Ansel Parchman created one of the biggest upsets in the track and field competition of the Olympics Games in Tokyo on Wednesday evening, when he won the 100-meter hurdles with a stunning run, beating favorite Grant Holloway of the United States in the final. Ronald Levy, the national champion, took the bronze in his first major global final in 13.10 seconds, just behind Holloway. In the men's 400-meter finals, Christopher Taylor ran a personal best of 44.79 seconds to grab sixth place. The event was won by Bahamian Steven Gardiner, followed by Colombia's Anthony Jose Zambrano taking silver in 44.8 seconds and Grenada's Kirani James in third place. In the relays, Jamaica's men's 4x100 meter relay team booked a place in the final at the Tokyo Olympics winning their semi-final heat with a fine 37.82 seconds at the Olympic Stadium Wednesday evening Jamaica time. The Jamaican women's 4x100 meter relay team also are safely through to the final after placing third in their semi final. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Melvin Pennant. St. Lucian Olympic swimmer Michaeli Charlemagne received a hero's welcome after breaking the local record in the 50 meter freestyle at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. The teenager was among five athletes chosen by the St. Lucia Olympic Committee to represent the country. Um, I remember driving into the village, looking looking at the Olympic rings, and in the there's this street with all the um, countries, all the flags of the countries at the Olympics. That just hit me, and I was like, wow, I'm really here, getting ready to represent my country. 18-year-old Olympian Michele Schalmine has been celebrated for her exploits in the pool after recording a personal best time and breaking the national record at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. The team finished second in her heat with a time of 26.99, a 0.28 improvement on the national record which she set some two years ago. Charlemagne says she went into the race with intentions to win her craft. Going in, my two goals were to um, swim a personal best time and also to just go into the meet open-minded, taking in as much as possible so that could make me a better athlete um, as I continue my career. But um, I, due to COVID, I was not able to compete in as, as many meets as I would like to. So that was something that I had in the back of my mind. But I also remember, I also told myself that I start, I started a new school two years ago and the training has increased, so that, so, um, that was kind of motivating for me. Charmaine was met with a warm welcome upon her return to St. Lucia over the weekend. Incoming Grosile MP, Kenson Kazomer says the teen is a role model worthy of emulation by other youngsters, including his children. Swimming and track and field for me, 
They are the maths of English, maths and English of our sport and development. They should form the foundation of how we develop our athletes because I had the privilege of living in Grosley and doing a lot of swimming and of course doing a lot of track and field and my strength as a cricketer came from my shoulders and back and that I attribute that to swimming and as somebody who never really got into a swimming program I have developed an absolute love for swimming. I have twin girls that are into swimming and they've heard your name for sure and of course you have presented yourself as somebody they could emulate. Member and the past president of the St. Lucia Olympic Committee, Richard Peterkin, highlighted the grueling journey undertaken by athletes to qualify for the Olympics. You must be glad in a sense to be back from Tokyo because I know what it was like. A lot of people don't understand how tough it is for young athletes generally, what they have to go through in order to represent their country. They think it's a skylight. Um, and it's been years in the making. You've worked hard, you've represented your country, you've represented your, your sport, and the Olympic Committee had no hesitation in putting you forward for a position to go and, and to assist you in every way that you can. President of the St. Lucia Swimming Association, Brian Charles, says the organization encountered some challenges on the road to the Tokyo Games. I don't know if it's swimming, but it's like every time we have a national team ready to leave our shores to go and represent us as a people, there is always tremendous trials and tribulations that follows um, the St. Lucia national swim team. And I've always been a part of it. Um, from our unlucky events in um, um, reaching up to um, Peru, where <laughs> under all the odds, we came out in flying colors. Michele now went to Tokyo, and again all, again, all odds, starting with her own personal affairs, she came out and she made all of us proud. Jean-Luc Zephyr also competed in the 100-meter freestyle. He clocked a final time of 51.94, placing 54th overall out of 71 swimmers. The association vows to work with swimmers in a bid to increase the number of qualifiers for the 2024 Olympics. Gina Filippi, HDS News Force. And that's our package. Thanks, as always, for making it PBCJ, the People's Station.